Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Yep. <laughs> All right. So once she hops on, you can make her chair or co-chair, however you want to work it. But have a great meeting. Oh, thank you so much. Hi, Nancy. Hi, Nancy. Hi. Hi. I just got a new computer, but it's not working, so I'm using my iPad. How are you? Oh, that, that, I'm good. Just to let you know, we're already recording because Angela already got us hooked up, just so. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so exciting though. Uh -huh. All the Zoom stuff. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I attended that uh, webinar last week on um, COVID vaccine implementation. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you got a chance. I sent that link out. It was very interesting. Yeah, I really um, have it, unfortunately. Well, yeah, you have a million other things to do. I wish I had lots of time to absorb all of this ever-changing information. Yes. Um, yeah, so I have my notes from that here. I could see a role that the Board of Health could have in um, using toolkits to educate um, people. Hi, Tim. Whoops. Hi. Hi. How are you? Oh, isn't that a nice How background? are you? I'm doing well. I know. I love it. And the background's great. Yeah, I don't know how to do that. I think my grandchildren do. My grandchildren can do, now that they're in remote school, they can, even the, the five-year-old can do stuff. <laughs> Yeah, we take each one one day a week. So we do remote school three days a week here at our house. Pick them up is, at 8.15. Is DJ coming and... today? DJ? Yes, he's supposed oh, to. Okay. Awesome. And I, I, t I emailed him this morning and Emma got him the link. So um, he should be here. But it's not, it's not five o'clock quite yet. Two more minutes. <laughs> yeah, I, I got a new computer, but I can't seem to get the meeting on that. So I'm using my iPad. All the trials and tribulations of all these electronics.
Let's see if I could do this on here. Adrian just emailed saying that he's on. DJ's not coming? No, no, he's supposed, he's trying to hear. Hold on, let me find out. Okay. There's DJ. Okay. We're getting there. Hi, DJ. Uh, you can at least hear me, so that's good. Yeah. I thought you had some kind of barrier that you held the public back from until you did your own thing. Some Zoom barrier. Hi. Hi. Is everybody else here? And oh, man. The printer right behind me decided when it booted up to do maintenance. So it's like in the oh. circle of what would not that too noticeable. Hi. 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 I got a new computer that doesn't seem to be working in Zoom. So I'm on my iPad, which is more frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> Such is life. Ah, there's John. See, I'm not getting that. Oh, man. Is Steve here? Yes, here I am, yep. Oh, okay. Okay. So, um, John here too? Yep. <sighs> Okay, I, I have a new computer that's not working, so I'm using my iPad. Okay, and it's five o'clock, so I will open the meeting. Where's my pursuant? Here we go. Okay, pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, general law chapter 30A, section 18, this meeting of the Board of Health is being conducted via remote participation. So I will have a roll call to make sure everybody is uh, working their video and their audio. So John. Here. Everything's working. Steven. Here. Tim. Here. Maureen. Here. Nancy. Did I get everybody? Yeah. Okay. So we're all here. And the first order of business is to review the minutes from our November 12th meeting, which I've done. Any comments, changes? If not, may I have a motion to accept the minutes as submitted? Sure, I'll move we accept the minutes of the November 12th Board of Health meeting as submitted. Second? I'll second. Okay, all in favor. Steve? Yes, aye. Maureen? Aye. Tim? Aye. John? Aye. Nancy? Aye. Okay, so they were passed. So next on our agenda is we have a guest. We're going to review the regulations of the um, smoking in public places and workplaces. And we have DJ Wilson here to help us. Um, welcome. It was last November 14th, we had the hearing on our last regulation. So now we're moving on to 
um, these regulations that Maureen has been working on with Steve. Maureen, do you want to just sort of be in take charge of this section? I'll see what I can do. Um, okay. <laughs> so thank you for being here, DJ. Um, I have been looking at our previous regulations. I think they're from like 2011. And I think <laughs> our major effort was to bring them up to date with respect to electronic cigarettes. Um, but there are also other areas that we should also address, including maybe expansion of some of the areas in which we were restricting smoking in the out of doors, like uh, parks and um, bus stops, et cetera. The other thing um, was that there's one thing that I found confusing and might look to you for advice about is some of the private private clubs, I guess the things like the VFW or wherever that Okay. Those regulations, we don't address, I don't think we addressed them in our previous ones. And that's something that, and looking around, there are a lot of towns that, that do uh, regulate that. Um, the other question is, you know, what I first did before there were the, what the new template was available, as I, I took the definitions from our new tobacco sales regulations for things like electronic cigarettes and just a number of different things that were updated there. And I pasted them into our old document to update those. I did notice they're, they're slightly different from those in the template now. And I kind of wondered in theory, is it better to match them with our other regulations and, or just go with how they're written? Um, and the other question I, that, you know, I get down into the weeds sometimes, but uh, the other question I had was around um, electronic smoking, uh, tobacco, uh, nicotine delivery devices that are allowed for medical use. And I understand why we don't want to regulate them in their sales, but I wondered if they shouldn't be regulated for secondhand exposures because it's not a difference in my mind of those two exposures. Um, and and I, I think what our, our major job, I think at this point is to discuss those, those, that list that was on the first page of the template of um, the places we might want to consider regulation. So really, I think we're, we're it's, it's not as complicated as our previous <laughs> you know, job of, regular, of updating the, the tobacco sales regulations, but we could probably just use some help and guidance in some of this. Okay. So um, I should first of all, I have, I'm looking at something that was amended in 2010. Mm -hmm. And um, we don't upgrade our ETS regulation that much because uh, other than forces from outside, you know, new things that are happening, mm -hmm. uh, the state has not, uh, hasn't really updated much, except mm -hmm. for um, this, the sales regulation sample that you were looking at probably uses the term electronic nicotine delivery system. That is what's in the new state law, ends short. Mm -hmm. And I'd have to look at that again, um, but we do have, you know, um, you do not have, okay, so we do in the sample have e-cigarette in there and mm -hmm. we don't, we don't um, have an exemption. Oh, we do. We say any electronic device not approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. And so, um, you know, for e-cigarette use, I mean, for secondhand smoke use, we could being probably more liberal than it is in the sales regulation and say, it doesn't matter if mm -hmm. FDA approves it or not, you know, you just don't want it being used in, the, in public. Mm -hmm. So let me just write that note down. Okay, so. Yeah, there just were some small wording things that didn't yeah. match. And I, I feel like they probably, that's probably irrelevant. Irrelevant. Yeah, at some point we need to, 
I say we, there's about four of us that review this, these samples and we need to go through it and kind of match it up better to uh, the new, the latest state law just to make sure there's no discrepancies. Yeah. So you have one first question. So I should say um, one thing that has not changed is that you at this point in time uh, match the 100, 200, 300 dollar finding system with the two years uh, mm -hmm. um, tolling period that still remains in the state law. And it makes sense just to do yeah. this. Okay, so I can go down the, uh, the list about it starts with ban smoking locally in and then we have a yes, no. So smoking bars, which is cigar bars, hookah bars, and vape bars now that has been included in the latest state law. We mm -hmm. haven't seen any because this of course started just about the same time COVID did. So uh, regular cigar bars and hookah bars are having a tough time without having people trying to open a vape bar that makes no sense in the time that they can't open. Smoking bars are in phase four in the governor's um, uh, COVID right. response. And we had banned those in the tobacco sales regulations. Okay, so so one thing would be to make sure it's in the uh, have it here too. Okay, uh, so that makes sense. Uh, I will say um, I I have done the sales right in front of me. In the beginning, we did this wonky legal. Um, there can be no smoking in smoking bars. Um, because um, the state law was anti-preemptive in letting cities and towns go further. But further for us meant that you could decide if it was smoking or not. But we have had um, a handful of cities and towns, actually by now it's probably a couple dozen. Number one being the city of Medford that accidentally did it and they just banned uh, smoking bars and there's been no legal challenges. So we feel confident just to say that no smoking bars period, not the no, no smoking and smoking bars, but just no smoking bars. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so private clubs, I'll, I'll jump around a little. Okay. Um, private clubs, uh, you know, at the beginning of this, um, when places, when restaurants and bars were supposed to went smoke free, in a number of communities, uh, they marched to the Board of Health and demanded that private clubs also be made smoke free because we had the instances where private clubs were acting like public bars mm -hmm. that they would have um, kind of fake weekend memberships for people and you know who could come in and go to a battle of bands on a Friday for five bucks that, that was a membership for the week and then uh, leave and so you know certainly bars and restaurants felt that they were stealing business from them especially when private clubs typically are cheaper places to drink. They, have, uh, they sometimes have a cheaper liquor yeah. license. And I should also say the private clubs are, have been consistently struggling with trying to stay in business. Uh, I was just what, reading one here locally that you know, Knights of Columbus is gonna probably close up. Um, so, what, so after that settled down and the town of Athol got sued and it went to the uh, state's highest Supreme Court, Supreme Judicial Court, and Athol won. We had a bunch of cities and towns put in place. I think we're a little over 100, maybe. And, um, and we kind of adopted, and, and then actually, oddly enough, we started seeing some private clubs coming to, a, to the Board of Health and asking, can you force us to be smoke free? Because we are doing, we constantly have this infighting amongst our smoking members and our non-smoking members about it. So that's also all settled down. So the way we've left it, and this is up, this is, this is for you to know um, what private clubs you have in Amherst, if they are private, if they are smoke-free on their own. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the town has uh, fewer than they think and then the ones that they have are already smoke-free. So it's not a heavy lift. Mm -hmm. And yeah, then, I, uh, I believe we only have one, and that's the American Legion. What was that? I believe we only have one club left, and that's the American Legion, because the VFW closed. Yeah. And so, you know, um, you can just, you can figure out, because you know your local politics better than me, you can figure out if it makes sense to have a discussion with them first. <laughs> they might be like, yeah, we're fine, you know, smoke free. And so, but we typically in other cities and towns where there's more than one, 
we do say, you know, if you're public, if your bars and restaurant community aren't complaining about the pri private club, then we kind of let it go. Especially, you know, you might want to say, when you're talking to American Legion, you want to, may want to ask them, what is your guest policy? Can I see it? Can I see how this rolls? And if you think it's stringent enough that they're really not letting anybody in other than uh, members and bona fide guests, then you know you might want to let it go. But it's your call. You, like I said, you will understand the personalities, the makeup of the club, and your politics better than me. Yeah, but well, it, it is something that is court tested, and it's even, okay. and it's perfectly fine to do. When I noticed other regulations about private clubs, there were more strict definition of what it meant to be a member. You had to be a member for at least like 90 days there, you know, there weren't shorter memberships. Um, yeah. If you were you hosting a different event, like a, a more that was more open to the public than the, the regular, they, you couldn't have smoking inside when that was in that part of the building or when that was happening. So it, they were pretty complicated um, regulation, you know, sort of trying to dice it a little bit. So when it's really private, you can do what you want. When it's not really private, you can't. So and that's a DPH. Like I, said, I don't know of any problems with American. Okay. Yeah. And I should say that was a DPH regulation that got promulgated about six months after the state law went to effect with the two biggest problems that we, we were just seeing mm -hmm. in the cities and towns, which is private clubs and Oh, what a, what a uh, smoke, you know, what an outdoor space, how much enclosed, how much of an enclosure can you allow in an outdoor dining space before they really are indoors and shouldn't allow smoking. And oddly enough, it's a calculation <coughs> that I, that I <coughs> think is actually valid in COVID days. It's a very, uh, it's, it's probably still a, it's a good calculation to figure out airflow for <laughs> for uh, COVID reasons. Yes, but we do have cities and towns that also have further, you know, that have allowed smoking, but they put some additional conditions on them, you know, having to do with, uh, and again, this goes down to the private, the, uh, that, your know, one private club's physical layout. You know, do, if you go out and visit it and you say, there's no way you can have a kid's party birthday party here mm -hmm. and expect people to smoke in the bar and it's not going to migrate to the kids party. So you might have something when rented out, when a portion is rented out, the whole place must be smoke free during that duration. Uh, and like I said, looking at their guest policy might be very helpful. And I can help you, you know, if you feel like you don't want to go the ban smoking route, but you want to add additional conditions. Uh, I can gather some of the ones that I know I can put together and figure out uh, mm -hmm. what, 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 what may, may make sense. So that uh, membership associations, I see hotels, motels, you say at least 50% of all in bed and breakfast hotel and motel rooms. We do have a handful of towns. It's more than a handful. It's probably maybe even up to two dozen, including the city of Boston that do ban smoking in hotel rooms completely. I, we don't have a lot of hotels in Amherst and one is on the UMass campus, which is smoke-free campus. The other one, um, I wouldn't even tell if it's operating and it seemed to be no, they didn't seem to have smoking rooms. I looked at the Airbnb, at the B&Bs, bed and breakfasts, and um, most of them didn't have indoor smoking. So I don't know that you know, we might survey them and ask them what they have. Cause it wasn't total, I didn't call. I just looked at websites to see what's happening. But it, it, it seems mm -hmm. like going all smoke free doesn't, does no harm. I don't know in, right. in the way it yeah. is. No, that's, yeah, that's good. And so, yep. Yeah. Um, and so outdoor restaurant bar locations, uh, we actually, I, our shorthand for, we have about six different ways to cut and dice if, if smoking's allowed in an outdoor dining section. And one of the most popular we actually call shorthand, the Amherst decision. <laughs> so you, it's the one you have. Um, uh, and uh, you know, yours is uh, 
uh, formulated to really follow the intent of the state's smoke-free workplace law, and that was to protect workers. And so just as a reminder, you say, if there's wait staff, you need to be smoke free. If there's no wait staff, it's okay. So, you know, the three tables outside of, uh, of uh, Starbucks uh, don't care about. People can sit there and smoke. Um, it's nice if they were put a little further away from the door sometimes, but they can smoke there. But once you start having wait, uh, uh, wait staff, then you need to be smoke free. We do have stricter ones that say anywhere where the liquor license extends to, anywhere where their property extends to, you know, but uh, some of that is reliant on what your city and town makeup looks like. You're mm -hmm. kind of, uh, I don't know, I'll call you suburban, you may say you're rural, but um, you know, you're not city of Boston that has, um, <laughs> you know, has uh, a people walking out the front door and they're on the sidewalk mm -hmm. in a lot of spaces. Uh, public transportation, bus and taxi waitings, um, we don't have that. Um, okay. No, we have the enclosures, and I've seen people smoking in those bus enclosures. I saw it up um, by. No, I'm um, saying we don't regulate that. That's what I meant to say. Oh, okay. Okay, but yes, I agree. There are those like three-sided enclosures, and right. Uh, I I think that would be reasonable to not have to be next to someone smoking in the rain or something. Right. Yeah. So I think we should include that. So bus stop enclosures, it's important. To yes. Mm -hmm. And on the buses themselves, do we regulate that? Or is that, I mean, the PVTA is the bus system. that. Yeah, this, I mean, an old uh, state law that predates the 2004 law that we've been referencing um, already says no smoking on, you know, MBTA and every other authority. And that's if you've ever taken the ferry to one of the mm -hmm. islands, you can't smoke on the ferries either, inside or outside, and because they lump all the state and regional transportation authorities together. So already this, sh this should be prohibited. Okay. Yeah. What about things like Uber and Lyft and that kind of thing? That is that not something we have jurisdiction over, do we? I mean, you can, all of this make, all of this is kind of an enforcement difficulty, mm -hmm. but you know, a lot of times it's really just putting up a sign gets you about, you know, somewhere between 70 and 90% compliance. Um, so you certainly could add it. I mean, I don't think that there's anything that says no. Okay. Uh, we'll find out what the generic name is for these companies. And then uh, for buffer zones around municipal building entrances, I don't know if you want to talk about just, uh, yeah, you did public, okay. Was it publicly owned or were you, did you in public buildings? Okay. So municipal buildings, you know, the typical range is 15 to 25 feet. Uh, we have that liberal range because, you know, if you've been to DPH in Boston, you know that. 15 feet away from the building is in the middle of the street. And, but, <laughs> but, you know, then we have towns like, you know, tiny towns out your way, like, you know, Leverett and <laughs> Monterey that, you know, <laughs> you know, you can be, you, you can basically walk in the cow fields <laughs> while you're having a cigarette. Uh, so 15 to 25. So it really comes down to what you think makes sense. I mean, I know your town hall. I know the building that you normally meet in. And so, you know, so it's just a matter of thinking, thinking it through and what 15 and 25 means to you. Uh, usually our most difficult um, uh, municipal building being smoke-free indoors and having people outdoors being far enough away is your DPW barn or shed or department or wherever they keep vehicles. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, so just keep, Keep, uh, think about that, think about their physical layout when you're thinking about the diff different distance. Uh, so you right now have 20, so you're smack in the middle of the two. Mm -hmm. It may still make, that still may make the most sense to you. Since this has been in place, do you have any recollection of complaints about people smoking near municipal building doorways? There had been kids hanging out by the front of the Bangs Community Center, but I think 
pre-COVID, they've moved off, um, but okay. they had been a few years ago hanging out there. And it was a problem because there's an overhang and it's outdoors right and there's there's some benches right by the entrance to bangs okay i think i noticed some regulations in towns that seem to regulate smoking within a certain distance of the school property i don't know if my my recollection is correct on that you could you probably know that better than i do is that anything yeah so the 2019 update I can't even tell you, 2018 and 2019 updates of state law. Um, kind of streamlined smoking on schools. It was all over the place. It, it mattered if it was private, public, buses, it was crazy. But right now it's all uniform that um, on property, on buses, in buildings, and at school, um, school events, even off site and private and public schools must all be smoke free. So, but you know, this is an issue at most schools, high schools, that kids, you know, learn where that zone is and they walk 20 feet away. And usually the way it happens is that, you know, you, my membership, selectmen, town counselors will get a, a call from a, a, a person who says, my, these kids are staying on my front yard. And so, uh, and so, so it does become more difficult to do that kind of beyond schoolyard um, enforcement because the principal, we just, we, we get a little nervous when we think that a principal is going to walk across the street and give out tickets. Mm -hmm. um, a principal, you know, but a principal could, uh, could apply the school rules to these kids. You know, in fact, your, your school book may already say, during school hours, these apply no matter, no smoking regardless. Uh, and so, uh, but then, you know, then the flip side, you think, well, the enforcer then would be police and mm -hmm. police generally are loath to do this. Uh, we actually, we have, uh, you know, at the height of this, the industry really likes to say, uh, to have possession laws. Um, uh, and we've fought them back a lot of times, but a lot of times they get, put in place because of the kids standing across the street. I'm on, I'll be leaving this for this meeting for my six o'clock at, at the Malden Board of Health where I'm a member. And Malden had precisely that. Kids were walking right across the street and sitting on the wall at the library. And, and you know, and there was no way to touch it. So the police chief, well, he was, a, he was the cop in school at the time. He's now our police chief, had an ordinance put in place. You know, but once you go to court a couple of times and the, you know, clerk magistrate looks up to you, and you know, with a raging mad parent and the clerk magistrate looks at you and they're like, you're insane to think we got to do this. <laughs> so we see, we only have uh, all the ones that have been put in place. I think we have two, uh, North Attleboro and maybe Harwich or Brewster that enforces it, nobody else does. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so that's a difficulty. So I would say it'd be more an issue if you had complaints about that to make sure that the school book says no smoking during the school day or vaping, regardless of where the kid is. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if a, if, a, if a principal saw them across the street on, on, a, on a residence yard, they could say you're subject to whatever the school book says. And then you can ask, you know, your police chief if you wanted to, but uh, they, uh, they generally aren't interested in walking up to a group of kids and, um, and asking for ID if they have such a thing. And also, we also get some uh, complaints that, you know, it, it's selective enforcement. So it's just another way for cops to go after big bad kids. Mm -hmm. so, so that's why we stand with that. Yeah. So you have playgrounds and swimming areas already. Um, you can uh, athletic fields. You, so athletic fields are those, you know, non-school athletic fields. So these are the people smoking at the little league game. Uh, parks you can add. You can either add them by just saying parks or listing them by their name. And retail tobacco stores. I don't know if you already. You don't. What, you I do. You already say no smoking in retail tobacco stores. Yeah. 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 And then, you know, expanding to include e-cigarettes, certainly we can do that. Right, right. Yeah. That, you know, just wherever 
they're smoking, they're, or smoking is not allowed, e you know, vaping is not allowed, e-cigarettes aren't allowed. Um, I don't think we had nursing homes in our list, but I have no idea what the policies are around nursing homes. Yeah, so the, uh, the um, state law says no smoking in nursing homes unless the nursing home comes to the Board of Health for permission to have a separate room only for residents, not for um, staff, not for visitors. It can only be for full-time residents. And um, this is a, a term I was familiar with when I was a student social worker at Westboro State Hospital 100 million years ago. And so that means a staff member can't smoke a patient. And that's where the staff member actually holds a cigarette in the mouth of the patient. <laughs> uh, <laughs> fortunately, I never had to do that. That was a... <laughs> but anyway, so, so they, can't, they can't do that either. Okay. And so I actually do think for those entities that uh, officially call themselves nursing homes, um, a lot of them belong to a national group and that national group and, uh, membership relies on that you be smoke free anyways. Mm -hmm. So this is yet another thing that if you could look at your, uh, what you got in town and see what they're doing and you may already find out pleasantly surprised that they allow no smoking. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, I had to laugh when I was looking at the state regulations of the two exemptions is one are, were the soldiers homes. Yes. Holyoke and Chelsea. Yes. It, it, it makes me cringe every time I see a news report about COVID cases at the soldiers homes. I know, I know. You know, right up front there. <laughs> <laughs> and so these, you know, these 70 year old plus guys are smoking in their beds and it's all such a big, huge surprise that they easily catch COVID. <laughs> yeah. um, so. All right. So we're. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm trying, I don't think we What's have any. Like we didn't re regulate the common in the last round. And um, Nancy brought up that one of the, one of the issues that was, that drove that was yes, the fact that they had this event called the Extravaganza. I remember this painful uh, conversation. <laughs> smoking going on. And, um, you know. I think that was captured by that registered events in, in J. Yeah. Uh, and so, but uh, my understanding is that it was, and that was a way to get around from actually saying that the commons had to be smoke free. But my understanding is that they have since moved on to private land. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which I can't believe your police chief or fire chief didn't say, oh, no, no, this is over. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, took them like 25 years and they finally said, uh-uh. Yeah, to think that your police chief is signing yeah, up yeah. on this every year, it's like, are you insane? <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, so, uh, so, um, so we, um, one other philosophical thing I was wondering about is, you know, if there's a public park and it's generally, you know, people go there a little bit, you know, they, it's not right in the downtown area. It's kind of off uh, in sort of the more rural areas. And sometimes people take a walk there. Sometimes they might go have a little picnic, but usually if you go there, most times there are probably three or fewer people in the place in a couple of acres. Um, the point of regulating smoking in an area like that is. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it was, it, it's partially, uh, and this goes along with beaches too. Mm -hmm. uh, part of it is uh, secondhand smoke. Uh, mm -hmm. And part of it from our academic wonky stance is it's not emulate, you know, kids aren't watching this. Right happen but a lot of it has to do with trash mm -hmm. so the yeah. first town that you know said no smoking on parks it was because a kid put his a cigarette butt in their mouth and the mother went to town meeting and ended that i see um, i should say I'm, I'm like thinking to myself who has this but the city of malden <laughs> again has uh, smoke-free parks mm -hmm. and boston commons is smoke-free 
And so what it does mean is that, you know, we, uh, this, I be, DPH used to have and may still have nice sturdy metal signs that say no smoking. And, and again, it gets to a, a spot where a non-smoker could just point to the sign on a beach or at, at a park and say, you know, you're not supposed to smoke. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you get, you, you, you can go a fair long way doing that. It's again, spectacularly rare for a cop to care about enforcing any of this. Uh, I'm not sure even on Boston Commons if they've given out a ticket, but I, but someone reported back to me because our office is only about four blocks away that, you know, they walked through and there was a huge sign on a, like a, a sandwich board <laughs> reminding people they couldn't smoke, smoke tobacco on the parks. But of course, you know, you have pot smoking everywhere. Well, that's what I was going to say. The other flip side of this is when you do see people smoking, they're smoking all kinds of things that's in the true. same kind of park. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, um, when my they're in their cars, a lot of people will be in their cars and smoking. Mm -hmm. But my grandchildren, when I used to bring my grandchildren to Golf Park and War Memorial Park when they were little, I would see cigarette butts and I'd pick them up because I was afraid the kids would pick them up and put them in their mouths. Yeah. So, so that was a concern of mm -hmm. the butts. And certainly that's the reason why beaches, you know, most of the Cape by this point, most Cape towns have banned smoking on their beaches as well as the state beaches and as well as the national seashore have all banned smoking on their beaches. But you know, enforcement, the National Seashore actually may have the best enforcement because they have ranges that are hired to go up and down the beaches. So, I mean, it is, you know, it's, uh, you know, ponder it, whether or not you wanna say smoke-free commons is a good thing. And, you know, the, the kind of purpose there would be, don't wanna emulate smoking for kids. We don't want cigarette butts and we don't want people exposed to secondhand smoke. Mm -hmm. So those public health messages are also something we can yeah. regulate or yeah. regulate to it to achieve. That's what I wondered if it was just the hazard of the secondhand smoke itself that gave us the right to regulate this, but obviously we can do it in a broader way. Yeah. Um, I, I think those were the questions that I had when I went through some of these options. I don't know if anyone else has looked, thought about some of the, these as well and have questions. Steve, Tim, or John, do you have questions? Uh, I do not. I, Look at no. back here. What our steps would be to come up next with a draft and talk through it, you know, review what we actually want to do and more. Yeah, and so I would offer first that I would send uh, Emma uh, some of the questions that came up. How do you, what do you call, what's the generic term for Uber Lyft? Um, a sentence for bus stop enclosures. Um, okay. uh, I think it's easy to say all, you know, the sentence for all hotels is easy. Mm -hmm. expand, expand this to include ends or, or e-cigarettes and yes. I wrote myself a note. Right. I, I think what that was one of the things I noticed is that it just I think this the template had just e-cigarettes as opposed to ends in the definitions and I wondered if I thought that maybe the, that whole ends thing should be what we're we're talking about. Yeah I'll review it just because uh, I just want to double check to make sure it doesn't have uh, something that interferes with uh, better clean air, but was great for the sales part of tobacco. Yeah. Yeah. Question, <clears throat> what does ETS stand for? Uh, environmental tobacco smoke. Ah, uh, environmental, got it. It's a wonky term that we've always gone back and forth and used that, ETS and secondhand smoke kind of simultaneously. Uh, mm -hmm. And now we've, the state law has added another wonky term but yeah. the wonky term they added and is actually more it's national good. used so yeah. we're getting there Uber and Lyft, the um normal name for that is ride sharing right ride sharing services 
They're a ride sharing service, yeah. yeah. I mean, I probably, I'll, I'll probably go on some state bill. I'm sure there's a state bill that, there's always a state bill that wants to further restrict them. So I'll go on the state bill and find out what the common, but it's probably ride sharing, you're right. Tim, do you have any questions? I mean, uh, just just came to mind, you know, ride sharing can be like Uber, but also ride sharing can be like private people just combining and try, taking a ride. Is it something we should also include there? Or? Well, I'm sure this says, this says, it says something with profit making somewhere in there. Or, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Correct, yeah. Mm -hmm. We don't need to reinvent the wheel because there's, <laughs> yeah. there's lots of places that are trying to limit their reach and the traffic jams they cause. They used to cause. Yeah. <laughs> I guess the other thing that we didn't talk about, it might be covered under more housing regulations. A different regulation is the public areas of, of apartment buildings or common places in, in the mm -hmm. oh, yeah. multifamily dwellings or something. Is that a different regulation altogether? No, I could go on this. Um, it's public areas of multi-private housing. So it's easy to do that with um, uh, town financed housing. So if you have a housing authority, mm -hmm. That's an easier thing to do. Uh, it's 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 a it's a it's a little more of an uphill battle. But I have a feeling that there's a town somewhere out your way that says no smoking on apartment building grounds. I'll look into it. Is that okay? Is that something you're seeing other towns regulate in terms of? Yeah, I'm just curious for me if the town regulated it or the apartment building owners did. Uh, so I'll have to look into that um, because um, there's a gen gentleman I work with that works on this, but a lot of times he spends as much time just convincing big apartment complex owners to do to go smoke free as he does, you know, with cities and towns that want to do something. But I'll look into it. Thank you. It wouldn't surprise me if some for fire regulations or fire insurance for large for apartment buildings might might prohibit smoking in the public places in a private. I, I don't know how that works, but no, you're correct. You know, I think, I think that's in there. yeah, and and um, yeah. I recently moved and we were in a swank apartment complex in Malden and uh, they made you sign a thing that you uh, would not smoke marijuana in your apartment, but they weren't a smoke-free building. But, uh, you know, it's, it was just filled with millennials for lack of a better term. So very, very, very few smokers all together, you know, so it was, mm. it was never in trouble. But now and then you'd smell pot and like, okay, where are the, the police on this? <laughs> It was mostly high school kids standing outside and it was just coming up the, the window. Mm. So. Oh, well, that's helpful. That okay. Really helpful. Yes. Okay. Thank you very, very much. You're very welcome. How Thank often you. do you meet? Just out of curiosity. Once a month. Okay, I'll, I'll definitely get to the, I'll get to the suit these ideas to you, Emma, probably within a week. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, DJ. Mostly, I say that and people think I'm a and I, I, have no mem I have no short-term memory, so I'll forget what I've talked about unless I do it soon. <laughs> <laughs> I hope your Malden Board of Health meeting goes well. Yeah, I think so. You know, we're constantly, well, uh, we're, I'm sure we're back in the red because our neighbors have been red since day one. Everett, Chelsea, Revere, mm -hmm. Lynn. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so it's tough. All right. And so yeah. is the Irish American Club in, in Malden smoke-free? 
now uh, we we have about four uh, <laughs> private clubs. We, you know, at the time, see, this is one of the you know, it's a high big political issue, right? So, what mm -hmm. ends up happening is that the mayor gets wind of it, and usually the mayor belongs to half of them, you know, for political reasons. <laughs> <laughs> And so it got kiboshed early on. We are now two mayors out from that. But I, you know, but I know that um, a handful, just like everywhere else, have shut down for, you know, not being able to pay rent. And then I think a handful have gone smoke free on their own. So I wouldn't be surprised if we did a survey to find, you know, it's only one or two that are allowing smoking. Uh, so it just hasn't arisen to the, we just haven't done, done it since. But, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a political issue. That's why we kind of landed on if the restaurant bar community is complaining, you, the Board of Health has a political leg to stand on because you want to respond to that problem, you know, but if everybody's happy, kind of let it go. Thank you. Okay, very good. Have a good night. You too. Right. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. So Maureen, will you work on a draft? Yeah. Do we, you know, I guess we didn't decide to change really anything right here tonight, but I, I will just update the draft that I put out this week. Okay. And to send it again. I don't think, um, unless we want to think about adding certain things like parks or, you know, or that's more of a discussion. That's more of a discussion, but I would really like to add the parks because of those butts. <laughs> um, do we think we want to survey like our bed and breakfasts or hotels to see what their policies are or before making any changes about 100% um, smoke-free room inside indoor spaces. Um, I, you know, do, I guess the question is when, when do we um, talk about the things that we might want to change? And should I, should we just, you know, there's, I've already updated the drafts with the um, template in mind and, you know, with the electronics, electronic cigarettes and all of that. And it's what's outstanding really are those decisions, I think, more than the, the text. Yeah, well, for the um, hotels, motels, we have what used to be the Lord Jeff, I can never, the in on, on ball. Yeah, I think that's smoke um, at Amherst College. And then- Yeah, the Walnut Inn, the campus center which is umass which is umass and then the um university, university. lodge which is now the uh homeless shelter is it just the homeless shelter that's what i couldn't tell that, that's all they're doing right now yeah um and then w there's like the allen house i think and that's right in or something i forget there are a few other air there are a few other b and b's and some had right. smoking policies on their websites, but I think a couple yeah. didn't. Mm -hmm. By the way, don't assume with, I'm sure that I assume the Lord, the uh, ex Laura Jeff is smoke free, but it's not owned by Amherst College anymore. It's not anymore. It, it, it's very associated with Amherst. They hire the people to run it, but it is not owned. It's a separate company now. Is it, is the property owned by Amherst College? I doubt it. I'm anyway, sure. they're smoke free, but I, I felt yeah. like. I felt like it had something to do with it was a college property, but it gets I mean, the, I'm sure the college would have put a lot of pressure to make that happen, but I'm just, just as yeah. a fact, it's not really owned by the college. Yeah. Okay. And the last time we worked on these, most hotels and lodging places do not want smoking because it's terrible to clean the rooms. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Just so. <laughs> That's that's what we got, you know, in 2010 that, you know, they're all for no smoking. Okay, so we probably don't need to worry about that. But that was my sense is we probably don't need to worry about that too much and probably be welcome if it's not already in, 
in force by yes. owners. There yes, might be an because, argument against because the what? But having having the saying that you can have fifty percent is kind of encouraging something that maybe we don't want to encourage. <laughs> Maybe better to say nothing rather than 50%. right. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah. Say there's no smoking. Yeah. I think one of the right. just guides a place where people can smoke outside. You know, I forget the one down on Main Street on the right side. Um, the Allen House. Yeah. yeah. And then there's another one down farther that they are up higher that they own. That's the same people. Mm -hmm. It's more cross from the uh, Dickinson House. Yeah, um, yeah. But, but but the Allen House people own that one too. Yeah. You know, there's going to be a new supportive housing on Northampton Road, and the, by right. far the most contentious issue. I was very involved with going uh, monitoring it. And the, the most contentious issue before the ZBA was, but what about smoking? Obviously, there'd be no smoking inside. But should you put it outside, or will people just then go to the street and the neighbors? And so they're going to have a smoking pavilion outside. I see. And the, and the location of that was subject of hours of discussion. Mm -hmm. Now, was there a bread, bed and breakfast on, right in that section? It was. It, that's not anymore. It's a private the home. Wilbur's now. house? Yeah. Wilbur's not, don't do it. They're they don't still do there, it. but they don't do the B&B, &B, right? Okay. So, so I'll, I'll, make a few executive decisions and then we can okay. go them. for it go for it thank you it's all yours maureen all right sorry okay so we'll move on to new business and emma do you want to present about the uh physician need for covid vaccines yeah so um so part of us getting up and running um, with being part of the state vaccine dis vaccine distribution plan is us having a provider that will sign off on those standing orders so we can enroll in that program. Um, this has been something that Jen Brown and I have been working feverishly on, not to say feverishly like we're symptomatic, um, but like really excited and eager about. Uh, and I, I'm really excited to announce um, that we finally were able to have a, a very a great partner um, that's willing to do this for the town of Amherst and give back. And I'm so excited about that. And um, it's Dr. Kate Atkinson. Um, you know, I have to say that I, I didn't look at the, the agenda until today, but I did find I um, kind of by chance, I was, I just signed up, I delayed this because I was working for a college and I thought all my, my emergency issues would, I would work on, work for, with them on, but I signed for the Massachusetts um, Medical Reserve Corps. Oh, and in, in looking at documents there, I found something in the general law of Massachusetts that indemnifies people uh, when they're providing vaccines. Correct. And yeah. as the reason I didn't sign standing orders before was I did not have malpractice insurance. So I could do it. But if Kate's doing it, I have no problem with that. But I, I, I no, but yeah, no, that is wonderful to hear. I'm so excited about that. Because um, we are going to need other standing orders looking towards 2021. Right. Or influenza, hep A. Right. So I, it was news. It was good. I thought it was, whoa. Now, yeah. the other thing is I have to check because I let a couple of things expire, which I don't know if I need a mass controlled substances um, right. in order to do that or not. So I'll, I'll do a little more research, but that was something I thought, oh, I could do this. No, I love that. I love the eagerness to like look into it and the commitment to our community, right? Right, um, well, that's why I signed up for this this um, medical reserve course. I think we've got a lot of vaccines to put out there. That's and right. Need some people, I wanna be ready to help with We that. have a lot of good work to do, right? Yeah. That's yes, exciting. Kind of so, yeah. Emma, this um, so this physician standing order is to allow who to do what? So it's to allow the town of Amherst Health Department to be able to receive the vaccines from the state when they're distributed 
And then once um, the parameters are met for the different phases of the population that are gonna be identified to get them, that Amherst Public Health vetted staff, um, which we are gonna go work with the MRC. So I'm really excited to hear that you reached out to them, Maureen, because um, the MRC is great because they can do a background check and vet everyone's credentials. So that way we've already have had an overwhelming amount of volunteers uh, come forward that are um, wanting to help with our population, but certainly wanting to make sure pe that people have um, been trained and have good practice and have had backgrounds is a big part of that too. Mm -hmm. So, so um, to, ad to administer the vaccine. Yeah, to administer the vaccines and then also maybe help with flow of people if they're not necessarily um, a paramedic or a doctor or, or a nurse, right? Um, it takes a lot of many, people. <laughs> yeah, there's many other roles that are gonna be needed to be part of this to make all, everything successful. And I know that we're gonna have um, many opportunities to exercise dispensing vaccines. It's not gonna be a one and done. This is gonna be like a building project over the next year. Um, and I, I think as long as we're open to, to feedback and suggestions and accepting those volunteers, I think there's, it's gonna be good. To, to, what, um, to what point of vaccine distribution is your understanding that the minus 81C mm. uh, requirement holds for the Pfizer uh, um, vaccine? Where, where does that end in time and space? I don't know the exact time of that. What I do know is that the Pfizer vaccine is really gonna be, the capability of being able to distribute that effectively is really gonna be limited to acute care hospitals. Okay. And yeah. those settings because yeah. of it having. I do know that some communi other community facilities are purchasing those ultra frozen, those ultra low vaccines. Um, we have our great new refrigerator that we purchased with grant money, we're so gracious. And then I also purchased um, for our department uh, a new back, uh, new freezer that can at least go to down below 40, but not that deep, deep low All right. temperature. So we won't but be I able to do to, it. But I like wanted to expand with Moderna. <laughs> yeah. But at least yeah. now we can have that, right? That's great. Yeah. yeah. Well, it seems like- I attended this- um... Oh, okay, you can say talk more in and then I'll say what I found out at a webinar I went to. Limited in general, um, in terms of the numbers, you know, into the first phases. Mm -hmm. of the, now they're thinking 100,000. Yeah. And, yeah. And so we're not going to probably see that again until much later in the process. Right. But I know Moderna is coming down and mm -hmm. a bunch of the other players. So. Right. Or to come with this story. Yeah, so I attended this um, COVID vaccine webinar that Nancy Messner from CDC and Dr. Amanda Cohn from the Immunization Corps oh, no. um, talked about. And they said initially um, the Pfizer comes in 975 doses per shipment. And those are really gonna be the hospital ones. But when Moderna comes out, that comes in a hundred doses per shipment. Mm -hmm. And that's what we will uh, see more in the spring for the general population. Um, My meeting just froze. Uh, what froze? No. And I'm the host. Um, and, but one thing that, that kept coming up- I need over, people off the internet. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> okay. One thing that- I, Got a bandwidth that, issue going on, huh? <laughs> the Board of Health, probably they'll be developing um, lots of uh, vaccine communication tools. And I think one role the Board of Health might have is communicating that to the public and helping with the communication of that. Um, because that's gonna be a big- um, factor in whether people are going to get this vaccine or not. Mm -hmm. Dr. Fauci and um, Joe Biden also just said that they'll be the first in line to get it. So did Andrew Cuomo. <laughs> um, 
And so the first group is December through March, if we're lucky. And then the uh, second phase will come after that. And that will be the non healthcare, critical workers, congregate settings, other older adults. And then the third will be um, phase will be the other general public. And they do say people who've had COVID should get the vaccine, but they should be in the, the fourth phase. Um, and a lot of what, what was said in this um, has been out in the public media. Mm -hmm. But they are, um, they're going to enroll providers, train the providers. There's lots of toolkits and materials for providers. And then the vaccine averse event reporting system is with the CDC and FDA, but it is an opt in. Um, this vaccine safe is a new smartphone based monitoring, and that's an opt in rather than an opt out. Um, reporting um, and really helping people understand what mRNA is. Um, and there are going to be ready made uh, materials and toolkits that will be coming out with all of this mm -hmm. vaccine. Mm -hmm. That's what I got out of it. And you're going to be getting a shop card for your first and second. The big thing is, do we have adequate monitoring systems? And how do we get people back for their second dose, mm -hmm. which is three weeks later? So there was another one yesterday, a uh, webinar, but I, I missed it because I was doing the remote. We do remote school for three days a week, we take one grandson each day and do the, the school for them. So I'm not as free. Mm -hmm. Emma, are you back? Yeah, I'm sorry. I lost connectivity. Oh, that's there. okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, the joys of, elect, of meetings, right? Of like the Zoom stuff. Okay, so you have the doctor. Do you want to give us a, a report? Yeah. Um, so, wow, I've been here a little bit over a month. Can you believe it? By everything wow. that's gone on, I feel like I've been here for years. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, it's, it is a whirlwind, but I'm, I feel really blessed to do the job um, and be here. Um, uh, just trying to organize what we're doing to get ready to deploy that vaccine and making sure that we're set up to do that. Um, planning for it. I know that with our continued COVID response, um, relationship building with UMass and really making sure that with their planned additional students this spring, that we're gonna have a successful, hopefully seamless contact tracing program with them. I'm really trying to work on that. Uh, we have a meeting next week with Ann and her team. Um, also, we're hoping to increase our, our local contact tracing ability with the use of, with the volunteers of, of the school nurses for Amherst Regional Public Schools. Um, and we've been in talks with them um, and they've been talking with the union for that to make sure that we're all being, um, following the rules with that, uh, but but they have this skill set and we're excited to have them. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, Shelter, shelter is going well with Craig's store. Um, there are definitely unique challenges this oh, year God. with the homeless population, um, with, the, with COVID. I know that Pam Schwartz for the Western Mass um, Housing First group uh, it has been having great meetings. Uh, so we've been able to strategize and, and problem solve with other shelters in the area and municipalities throughout Western Mass um, to be able to mitigate how are they dealing with COVID and all of the challenges with that. 
great news is that Western Mass is going to be having a uh, quarantine and isolation hotel out here in Western Mass. I believe Pittsfield was finally approved for that. So that'll be good. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of the population feels strongly about staying in Western Mass. It, it's an area that we're comfortable in. I know that you get me past out east past 495, I don't know what to do with myself. There's more than three lanes of traffic and I get anxious. Um, so there's been a lot of good work being done. They're using the, the hot yoga studio for those showers um, during the day. They've been very thankful for that. Craig's Doors has been managing that environment um, to make sure that it's clean and safe and during the agreed upon times. Uh, our our pre-admission testing policy for them for COVID samples before the, the guests go into the UU has, has worked really, really well. Uh, in addition to that, we're doing uh, every four week surveillance testing uh, with the assistance of Dr. Bossy, who's helping coordinate that. Um, what else have yep. we been doing? Yes. Emma, who's, who's doing the... No, Dr. That... Bossy from Healthcare for the Homeless. Mm. Oh. I had reached out to the Musanti Center, but unfortunately they're having some, some operational challenges and their space is so narrow down there that it makes it hard to be able to do that. Emma, who's, um, who's doing the, the analytical work on the testing you're doing on the, the, the guests at the homeless shelter? Yeah, so Cooley Dickinson is doing it. Dr. Bossy is the ordering provider. So Dr. Bossy gets called with the results, which is great um, because she has good relationships with each one of the patients. That's probably why we're gonna stay with this model of testing for the homeless shelter, because we're able to actively monitor those results as they come in and respond accordingly. Uh, with the UMass asymptomatic testing, it's a great resource, but you have to, there's a couple barriers that would make it challenging for the, that population to get their results. Um, and Dr. Bossy wouldn't be the ordering provider. So we wouldn't get direct results from them for that. Now, is the initial test a rapid one or is it, it just the same PCR? So it's, uh, we try to order the expedited one. I think that's what they call I don't it. Know all the, I don't even know all the options. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what we try to order. Um, I do know that uh, what I agreed with Craig's door is that they could, as if someone has a pending test, they could stay in a UML room if it was an uh -huh. exceptionally cold night um, during that time while it was pending. I see. Um, so that way they would be housed, but certainly in a contained area to reduce transmission and everything like that. Sounds like a really good plan. Yeah. It, yeah. Is expedited QPCR or is it antigen? Nope, it's PCR. It's a rapid PCR. It, That's a great it, question. It's just getting it fast enough. I mean, the, yeah. the technique can only be done so fast. But, yeah. Uh, but, but the but results it, come quickly. But yeah. getting in the queue, getting in the yeah. queue. Yeah, is, it's or, like ordering a stat right, rather than a routine lab, right? Yeah. 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 Um, in terms of what else? Um, Jen Brown did another flu clinic today at an elementary school for Amherst Regional students. Um, I'm not sure how that was attended, but that was happening at about 4 p.m. as I was coming home to plan for this meeting. And we've been just really trying to figure out what's our long-term goal gonna be? Um, I know that's something I'm really excited to, to talk with you all about um, in terms of what does the Board of Health and, and our health department wanna see our future vision be? Trying to, while COVID is like the really intense work that we're doing right now, that, that long-term goal, um, kind of looking on the other side of that is also something that I'm really excited for, so. Does anybody have questions? I can talk forever. You don't yeah, want me to I, talk forever. <laughs> uh, I, I actually have a very specific question related to uh, contact tracing. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's contextual in that I'm a department head here at UMass and we had a, a 
asymptomatic positive tests from one of our grad students in a lab, okay? So there's a path and, and I get lots of stuff happen, you know, starts happening. But I will say, I'm, I'm curious to know, so without prejudicing anything, uh, it, at, at, in Amherst, when, uh, and my understanding is that's handled by the university, by our, our public health nurse at UHS, right? The, the Right, the on-campus testing done by faculty, yeah. staff, and students are handled by UMass. Right. So the asymptomatic testing that'll be done for community members will be handled by municipalities. In terms of contact UMass. tracing follow up. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So if you guys, if we get a you get a positive test result, right? Yeah. And it comes in through Maven or whatever the system is, you guys get it. And Jen follow maybe follows up with the contact tracing or someone else does. What kind of questions does that person ask the person who tested positive? Oh, sure. There's a whole, I can actually, I could probably email you the materials, the material for that. It's a whole preset template of interview questions that we have to ask. Um, and it has really evolved since yeah. this all started in March. There has been many different renditions. Uh, and the most recent one focuses more on the, on where people have been and what kind of contact they've had, really focusing on household. Have you been someone with around someone inside your household or outside your household without a mask? Uh, have you been to a gym? Have you been to a religious service? Have you been to some other kind of performance? Um, what if you work in healthcare or a daycare facility or another inst group institution like a university or college or high school? Um, let's, let me give you a scenario, and, and what you haven't said yet is something I'm very curious about. So okay. let's say uh, I was in the lab for three hours. We we're both face masks, but we were working in the lab with the, a person. Yep. Would the contact tracer, I've always thought the contact tracer would get the name of that person and follow up in some manner with that person that you were in contact with. Am I completely wrong in that? Well, I think that philosophically, it sounds really easy, right? And very clear. No, no, no. And then when we get down the pathway of uh, were you with, if within six feet of that individual? And when right. you were within that six feet of the individual, was it for a, a total cumulative of 15 minutes over a 24 hour period? I heard um, 10. Okay, 15. Yeah, right. whether you're wearing a mask <laughs> or not. Yeah. So th those are the things. And, and what? social behavior and memory makes things very less concrete to people. Yeah. Um, and yeah. it makes it really challenging for contact tracing. Uh, I think that we are learning new things every day about this virus. I think that six feet and 15 minutes is, is a good marker right now. But I know that there was just uh, an article that I saw this morning out of a study done, I believe in South Korea, where someone was um, only around a, a, a infected individual for about five minutes and the feet was much greater than six feet. So I think we're learning more each day. Um, but I, I, still, yeah. I just want to get to this. So Is no, there, you, you there, if there, you weren't within six feet for 15 minutes or more identified by the individual who's positive, then you wouldn't be identified as a close contact and you would not be notified. Okay. Let me just say that in the UMass context, there were students who worked in the same workspace that were shocked they weren't contacted by contact tracing. Yeah. And, the, and the person who was positive told me, told not me, but another person, that they were not asked the names of the people in, that they were in contact with. Mm. And that, that part blew me away. It was yeah, that like, would definitely I, be concerning. I don't, I mean, contact with a space in a room, who cares? It's about people and transmission. So I was really, Surprise, but maybe what you're telling me is if the person who was positive did not convey, the, there's some triggers that would convey the contact tracer asking for the name. It's, it's yeah. that, that would, and it sounds like it's pretty, pretty high bar to, to ask for the name. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm hearing you say. So, yeah, I do know other countries, not the United States, but have instituted tracking ability. Mm -hmm. um, I know that there's something that you can have on your iPhone, uh, but inherently that that's very, that kind of goes against a lot of people's 
beliefs here in the United States in terms of um, specific freedoms. Oh, yeah. uh, but I, I do know that that has made contact tracing in other countries much easier. We found ourselves uh, debating myself, myself and my colleagues, uh, just this uh, ethical dilemma between uh, HIPAA and privacy and public health. Because um, mm -hmm. uh, we want to protect other students in our labs, you know, and in this case, I would say other students, and we're lucky, students can go get tested twice a week, three times a week, probably if they wanted to under these cases. And because the person who's positive communicated with individuals, they took action, but it had nothing to do with the contact tracing system. Yeah. That, that really was based on that individual sharing. And what I ended up doing was cutting off emails that went to a whole bunch of people with people's names. I just said, listen, we, the, the, no names here. If you yep. want to talk the name, let's phone or, or text or text me, but no emails with lots of people and let's figure out how we share and whatever. But it created, a, you know, it's this a place where students were, okay, so who's going to say we can go in the lab or not in the lab? Um, the, you know, there's a lot of stuff. So, so far, it seems that that incident did not lead to any other of our students being infected and may have been related to an outside activity at a, at a, at a other kind of activity of the sorts you mentioned. So. Yeah, uh, anyway, but that, certainly I can bring uh, back this, this kind of case report, this individual story back to the UMass contact tracing team at the yeah. meeting that we're gonna have, but just not necessarily, but I think we all kind of share these stories or, or have heard second mm -hmm. or third hand of these stories. And I think that there's there's room for improvement. And it's not that we're trying to get anybody in trouble. We're trying to improve the response for our community. So, so sooner right. than later, we can stop wearing masks all in public and social distancing and then get back together as soon as we can when it's we, safe. The person who made this, and oh, the other question I have for you, and this is this, I, I don't know how you answer this. Mm. So the person who was surprised they weren't contacted had spent four hours inside a place in a lab setting, but about four or five days prior to the positive result being known, right? Mm -hmm. So how far back? That's a question, I like, where do you start? Because the person who got tested, there's a window. You yep. may have been positive for a long time prior to that, just become positive. What, what do you, what's the guideline there? I'm just curious from a science perspective. Yeah, so it's two days. Before, Only two days. Before when the test was administered, not resulted, yep. right? Because there's delays in processing the yeah, test. Yeah, 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 yeah. So back to when the test was performed or the onset of symptoms. Yeah, and this is an asymptomatic situation. Yep. So we would only go back to two days before that test was only two administered. Days. Okay. Okay. Yep. It's a great question. These are questions we get all day long, John. I love these questions. <laughs> Can someone be asymptomatic? infectious for two weeks or 10 days or what what's the thinking yeah so i think that's no. what's hard um there's definitely the possibility i i know that there's people that are asymptomatic throughout their entire time period but they've yeah. shown that the viral load is is highest in the prodromal period with the two days before the onset of symptoms um and when that pcr would come back um there are perfect answers with this. No, 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 I, I was trying I know, to struggle and, with this. Oh, but I know it's so hard for me. I just love clear stuff. Um, no, and, it's, yeah, yeah, it's so there's things that we're learning every day. Yeah, so I think this person's contact of that duration was more like four or five days before the test was administered. It's like the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, this was a test given the Monday after Thanksgiving, a positive result Tuesday. So it was too far ahead. Right. To be a concern. Another person walked probably outside for a half an hour or 20 minutes with this person, distanced with masks, also probably not an issue. So we were point yeah. there was, I don't think there was any, and the person was so surprised. Uh, it mm -hmm. has, no, has no idea how they became positive, actually. I mean, yeah. Really don't. So and and I think that's a that's definitely a story that we're hearing a lot too, is just people really not knowing. Um the, the statistics coming out are still showing that the majority of transmission right now is occurring in households, small gatherings, people that you're comfortable with, those, those close friends that you have, 
um, not necessarily any of you, but <laughs> just in general, um, it, the people that we let our guard down with uh, most traditionally, um, and that we all have to assume or take precautions and be alert that anyone around us at this point could be a carrier, mm -hmm. right? Oh, yeah. um, even if they're not displaying symptoms. And, and just because you have a test today and it's negative, you know, that's a picture, that's a snapshot, yeah. that's oh, a yeah. moment in time. And, and so many people will go, but I had a negative test yesterday. Yeah. Um, so there's, I think there's lots that people are learning. And I think a lot of people never realized how little they washed their hands before 2020. I had a couple questions. Spend some time in a men's room. You'll know. Contact tracing. <laughs> <laughs> it's bad. One I wondered is how cooperative you're finding people are oh, in, yeah. in this area in terms of responding to your questions. Oh, you. I love that question. Um, some days it's hard, right? Because we feel like telemarketers. Um, <laughs> and that in general, people really don't like to answer the phone and or answer hard personal questions with this person I don't even know who's like all of a sudden asking me mm -hmm. all of these things and why are you calling and who are you? However, I, I do think it has shifted since March when we started mm -hmm. making these calls. I think there's a greater awareness in terms of what contact tracing is and a little bit more acceptance in terms of how valuable it is. Um, uh, being on the front lines of this, of course, I wish there was more engagement back in March, but I'm really happy we have the engagement that we do now. Mm -hmm. uh, I do think our community in the Pioneer Valley um, is sounds from the, in, you know, the incidental reports from my other health directors and other places in the state. Uh, people seem more receptive here than in other areas. So, so I'm encouraged by that. The second question I have is when I look at those weekly state reports that give the the clusters and where they're occurring, yep. that seems to account for about 25% of the number of cases. So yeah. is it just that they people just don't know anyone? Else? You know, they don't have any contact that's known? Yeah, they report that so it's not known. Is two, right? Is a cluster just... So a cluster is two positive cases in, in, um, from, right. of five people in each area that have a common link. Oh, I thought it was just two, like you could, yeah. I didn't quite understand the definition on, on the website. Yeah, yeah. So it's a cluster is five people. I believe, I believe the last time I looked, I don't have it pulled up right now, yeah, but that okay. was five people. Okay, so that explains it a little better to me. Because yeah. I was thinking it was just they knew like these two people in the household, that was a cluster. No, because it has to be two different settings. So say that there is, um, like if there was two children in a family mm -hmm. um, whose parent ended up positive a day after, um, that would not be considered a cluster because it's one household. If it carried over to a different household with extended family members from Thanksgiving and, and another large family group, that could be considered a cluster. Okay. Another area where it kind of gets a little muddy is with sports. Um, they have changed the definition of a cluster for some sports, including hockey. Um, recently, a, a, there was a cluster identified of, of three mm -hmm. athletes in a team. Yeah. So it kind but of varies different households, apparently. Yeah, because yeah. usually I always remember a cluster often was three, but I mean, I guess yeah. it depends on how it's transmitted and other things. But. Yeah. And, and you know what, Maureen, tomorrow it's probably going to change. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I've only done this limited ways at Mount Holyoke and we had a pretty good handle on, you know, we could get those kids and we could, yeah. you know, it was an easier thing to trace, you know, we'd get the class schedule, the roommates, the, the you know, sports teams, the, you know, it was just a smaller universe for yeah. the most part. Um, so I can see how hard this, this can be in these numbers and this yeah. very contagious illness. Yeah, I will say 
today in the last couple of days, we've, we've started to see what I, what I refer to as the flip, um, where we had 19 cases yesterday and only one was associated with, with college related. Oh, yeah. And there was 18 in our community and, and these vary throughout the age span, um, from one and two year olds all the way up to, um, some elderly and, and these people are sick. Um, and are, are really needing help and support. Uh, a lot of them do have extended family members and friends that can help give them services, but we are working with uh, CHD in terms of giving extra supports and connecting people with so some social services, re that rental assistance. Um, I know that Angela gets a lot of calls on the COVID concerns line, and I'm just really happy that that Amherst is able to help with that and connect people with those kind of fundamental things that local boards of health are, are, are mandated to provide. But I know all of us who are on local boards of health also feel like the societal need to provide um, while people are so sick in quarantine and isolation. So. Can I ask one more thing about <clears throat> contact tracing? It's just a general question. So I've heard that um, in some of the places with even higher prevalence, the contact tracing is pretty much impossible. It's just gone beyond any reasonable ability of, of even a well-staffed mm -hmm. team to do it. And it does look like Massachusetts as a state is headed towards a much higher level. Uh, are we approaching that? How do you see the next month going? Yeah, I mean, un until, you know, the captain's not gonna leave the ship until it's, it's down. Um, <laughs> That was funny. It was my own internal joke. I'm laughing at my own jokes. That's bad, Stephen. <laughs> um, we've reached that point in the meeting. Um, we do feel like that might be coming. It is very disheartening to feel that way. Um, but, you know, we're just ready to pivot if the time comes as directed by the state to, to our mission more on vaccines and doing that outreach rather than this contact tracing. But we're really leaning on, on the state to kind of give us that guidance. Um, we're not ready to give up. I know that's why we've been working on continuing to build a relationship with UMass before those extra students come back and then also getting on those extra contact <laughs> tracing. That way we can have the capacity. Because my, Do my goodness, I don't know how Jen Brown does it. I covered this past weekend. Um, so she could finally have a, a day or two off for the like the first time in since March and what she just does such a remarkable job. I'm just so glad to have her. Do you think UMass is going to huh. renege on having everybody come back if the numbers keep increasing the way they did in August? I think that, is that's a money thing. Well, you know, you're not the only one to ask that question. Uh, I do know that we had a meeting with UMass earlier this morning um, with the town and, and that was one of the questions. And I think their response was that they're open um, to, to possibly moving more students to remote or, or other ideas as things come, but, but those are concepts that they're keeping in the back of their mind. Um, that I know that they also reported that they were hoping to bring back over 6,000 students and their response rate from students wanting to come back has not met that full level. Um, it's a, a couple lower. So um, I understand their, their desire to bring back more students, uh, but from a public health standpoint, I, I can't, I'm, I get, pleased when the number's lower, of course, but I also, I feel like that's a little self-centered and biased. Yeah, um, I don't know if Tim, you went to this, but the provost held a budget forum yesterday for all faculty, staff and librarians at four o'clock. And we, with, with 5,000 students on campus, we still have a $11 million budget deficit to fix. And if, and I asked, actually the question did get answered. If it's, if that's only a thousand, that's $28 million budget deficit. So, um, and, and nobody's said how that's going to be, be filled, but um, we met. So it's, it's very serious. The one good thing I think to be shared with the town is around the country, 
there's not much evidence of serious growth, transmission, whatever, of on-campus students. That's that's not generally a big issue. At least my read of the Chronicle I read and other stuff that on-campus students, even at pretty high populations, have been managed better than off-campus students. Let's put it that way. So I take that as positive, but yeah, certainly I could, you know, there's nothing that has to raise, uh, raise concern. Um, uh, I can see that big time. And, but this is, it's right at the economics, public health trade-off that we're all, the country's facing, right? And mm -hmm. there's things we could, yeah, not do and do instead, but that's never happened at the federal level. So appropriately, unfortunately. But that's great you're, you're, you're talking about those, those things. Did the, I asked the university the folks who are doing the dashboard at the university some time ago, and they just they changed what they did, and I don't know. I I wanted to see a plot or the ratio of the fraction of positive tests that were asymptomatic versus symptomatic, mm -hmm. and um, I was you know I'd have to do it piece by piece, and they used to go to a page that said of the three cases, their right. flavor. They actually stopped doing that. Right. <laughs> and, they? Yeah, and I wondered if there was a <laughs> A HIPAA thing wondering about. In other words, if you knew the test results on this day and it was two students and they, mm -hmm. I mean, there's, it was a little, maybe it was a little harrowing in too narrow. So instead of giving the thing I asked for, they actually got rid of the whole thing. So, um, and, and changed, added one plot, uh, that, that table they have, which is a weird table. Uh, but anyway, it, it I, I can bring it up to Ann and see what Ann Becker. Mm -hmm. Or Jeff Hascock, or thinking. But have you? I guess my question was, do you know that do, roughly? What do you think from the student testing asymptomatic versus? Symptomatic? I have no idea. Um, okay. However, I do know that the symptomatic testing is not done at the Mullen Center. That's done through UHS. Yes, and, it is. It's and, done at UHS. Yes. Right, and so like mm -hmm. a totally different flow. Um, yep. And you know they're not doing twenty thousand tests a week at UHS. You know, like. Just when I think of the volume oh, of great students I saw standing outside of the Mullen Center. Yeah, I'm not um, talking about tests, but positive. So, I mean, the vast, 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 vast majority of the asymptomatic tests are negative, which is what you want. Um, but of the positives, there are days, I, I think more than half are asymptomatic. In fact, I think, I think more like 70%. That's my take on that, but I'm not sure. Of the positive test of the positive results. Okay. Yeah, I can ask. I, I I just wish I was surprised. There are epidemiologist faculty who are doing this. And I anyway, I've asked a few questions and gotten answers that beat around the bush, but anyway. Um, it sounds like a, a classic answer for anybody putting it up. Yeah. <laughs> right. It is so wonderful that this testing center opened. Uh, Maureen Leslie's ecstatic. Yeah, no, I know. A lot of people yeah. are. A lot of people are thrilled that there's testing available in, in, really, in the, really you know, in this side of the river, you know, so, uh, yeah, that's a real plus. Uh, Part yeah. of, um, cause they're going to be able to provide the asymptomatic testing and for 10 and older. Mm -hmm. I do know that, um, I have been communicating with Meredith O'Leary, the health department mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. director in Northampton and we were facilitating, planning on facilitating still some mobile health testing uh, for the last, next three weeks uh, in Northampton and Amherst. Certainly, I think we have different missions of what we wanna achieve. The gap in service that I'm really identifying for Amherst is gonna be those, the kids under 10 mm -hmm. at that, and, and anybody including that, that are possibly in quarantine or have been exposed and identified as a contact and need testing, and mm -hmm. then also um, the people who are symptomatic. So with some leftover, I hate to say leftover, but some still available COVID Pioneer Valley Planning Commission money, um, I'm hoping to have three days of <coughs> testing, probably about 150 tests each day, which isn't a lot, but it's more than we ha would have otherwise. And those would be done through our vendor of county ambulance, which is a wraparound service that they're able to provide 
um, have staff come in, be able to have a whole platform where people can sign up before ahead of time. Uh, they have a lab where they do the tests and then they're gonna be responsible for um, reporting those results as well and getting them uploaded to ISIS to me then. So um, I, I am also really, really excited for the UMass site. Uh, hearing that come on board totally changed uh, <laughs> what the plan was, but I still, I know that there's there's people in, in need here. Um, and while the other sites are, are getting on board throughout the state, I think it would be great to do as kind of a bridge the next couple of weeks. Thank you. I have a completely non-COVID question. It's a very minor point, but the town has a YouTube channel in which all public meetings are posted. I don't think too many people look at it, but the Board of Health is very spotty. Many are missing. We don't have one for November, but other. Oh. And I just wonder who is involved, because I did talk to Brianna at one point. She referred me to somebody else, but never went anywhere. And um, and also the, the ones that are there are posted only many weeks after the meeting. Now, I don't care if they're posted at all, but if they're going to be posted, I would like all to be posted, and I think they should be posted promptly. So who could we go to with that? I will follow up with that tomorrow, Stephen, because I oh, okay. also agree. You know, I don't want to be on live YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> but, you want to be able to edit it? No. <laughs> no, I don't even care about editing. People can hear my my blabbering and uh, and where I lose my thought. But for me, it is important for us to get the information out there, right? We may only see one person on the meeting while we're doing it, but being able to access things after for our population, I think is really, really valuable and where we okay, need to be. So I'll follow up with that tomorrow. That's a, a priority item for me. Okay, thanks, Emma. Yeah. yeah. One um, last question is about sports, going back to sports. I saw uh -huh. something in the paper about how Amherst is going to have basketball and hockey. Mm -hmm. And I don't, do you know the thinking about sports? I think that there is a lot of passion and uh, family values with sports and athletics, which make it very challenging for people to weigh uh, health risks aside from them. Um, they did, the school committee did ask for my perspective. Um, mm -hmm. I gave them my thoughts um, based off of the guidance that has come out with the MIAA and DPH and then the kind of evolving nature with ice hockey that we're seeing. Um, and, and you know, they're their own committee and, and they had an opportunity for feedback. They got a lot of public comment. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so they made their decision. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I found it interesting that School can't be open, but sports can go. Yeah, I, I, I think it's really, I think people overall are, are really look seeking after things that they can kind of control. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's something that people really are looking to be able to have out there um, and available despite the health risks. Yeah. But I do think it's a pretty stark comparison, Nancy, that you're painting and something that I think we can all kind of see in the picture. Yeah, yeah also I read the article that they've hired this special consulting group for their 15 students that they have at school. And I thought, oh man, I mean, don't they have enough faculty, staff, and knowledge without spending more money for 15 students, but that's life. Yeah, I think that there's challenges with the um, structure and faculty and the union and, and coming to mutually agreeable terms. So, well, I would love simple answers. Sometimes <laughs> things aren't so simple. Um, yeah. I had... One question and one comment. Um, Emma, uh, I'm wondering if you got an email 
that was sent to health agents and board, board of health directors from Mass uh, DEP about the test of PFAS testing in private wells. Did you get that? I did get that. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. It's um, we're not a community that's uh, more than that that has a high percentage of people on private wells, so we're not we're not a target of our program, but um, of the program Mass DEP, UMass, my colleagues were that we're working on. But anyway, I was curious if the if you got yeah, I was on that list, and I know that it's also coming up um, in terms of not just the wells. I know the wells with that program, but um, with our our set our sewer as well. It's coming up, our our water. Um, I would had the opportunity to briefly speak with Amy Rosinski. I'm probably saying her name wrong. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but about before she was married, it was Lane. It was up. really easy, Amy yeah. Lane. But anyway, that's how I knew her. She was my student. But yeah. Hey, Muruziaki, yeah, there, I know that we're engaged with sewer stuff. We're engaged with, uh, this is a, maybe the stormwater question you were, that maybe. might be, that's another area of where COVID is being looked at. Or, well, PFAS is being looked at, excuse me. <laughs> right. I'm mixing There's up so my many things, John. There's uh, so COVID, many PFAS, things. and lead are all in my head at the moment. <laughs> um, I think I had meetings on all of them today um, at one point or another, but uh, great. I'm glad you got that. Yep. Okay. Um, and Amherst as a town will be having to sam do sampling and analysis and there's one free, we're in this program, there's one free round of sampling. And as a PWS, they could partake or before they have to or, or wait till they have to, it's, it's a mixed bag. A lot of people don't wanna know about problems you don't know about. <laughs> <laughs> right. The known unknown uh, situation. And then the uh, last comment is, uh, are you full up with uh, nativity gigs? Oh, uh, me, yeah. <laughs> the socially distanced tableau, yeah. It was in the Gazette this morning. Uh, uh, the other day, yeah. Did you like the lambs? They were yes, wearing masks. the lambs were very nice, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Last night, last night day job. <laughs> Last night I woke up three times having dreams that I was someplace and I forgot my mask. I mean, that's bad. Three <laughs> times. But Not Nancy, we I had to find my mask. <laughs> but we've all done it. None of us are immune to that, right? Oh, man, yeah. You gotta have them everywhere. I know, and then you watch, you know, old TV shows and people don't have masks on. I mean, it's right, you get upset that they're talking, yeah. they're too close. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's gotten so oh. bad. Okay, I don't have any topics not anticipated. Um, is there anything else? Any other comments? Next meeting for second Thursday. Yes, the next one is January. Whoops. I think we went over them. Oh, maybe we listed them before. Yeah, we might have listed them before. January 14th, I would think. think January 14th. 14th. Okay. All right. Okay, well, everybody be safe. Whatever holiday you celebrate or don't celebrate, may it <laughs> all be happy. And may 2021 be better mm. than 2020. I miss I miss us all meeting in in person. I'm Zoom is okay, but uh, it's getting tiring. Oh yeah, yeah, isn't it? It is, but I figure we have to do this till at least till April. Maybe May we'll see some breakthroughs. Oh, so you are. But really not until. But it really, in reality, not until the end of the summer. But I'm trying to be optimistic. Good for you. Well, at least in April, you can go outside again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe maybe we could hold an outside meeting. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. But how would the public? <laughs> you know, the public, they're invited. Uh, yeah. We visited some friends a couple of weeks ago and we had, we actually were overnight in a camper van in their driveway, but we had four meals, three meals outside in a driveway around a big wood stove that they happened to have the <laughs> wheel they had the thing roaring. So you get one side of your body warm anyway, but that was, that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
Okay. All right. So it's be it's safe, Jerry. everybody. Thank you, um, Emma. Thank Jen for all the work you're doing. Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah, thank and you. And Nancy Schroeder, the uh, our admin assistant, just to, is helping out so much too. Well, I thank just, her too. Yeah. yeah. I move we adjourn. Okay. Second. I'll second that. All in favor? Tim. Oh, uh, so we have. We have to do this, right. Maureen. Aye. Tim. He said, I, he, I, he said, I, I, Steve, <laughs> I, John, I, Nancy, I, okay. The meeting is ended and be safe and see you next year. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.